Okay, so there's this Christian apologist on YouTube called Inspiring Philosophy. Yeah, that's not a joke, but he's here to answer a very old question. Why is there no proof of God? The Messianic Maniac made a great rebuttal. I'll link that down below, and uh, I thought I'd give it a try. Alright, kid. So, I'm anxious to hear what you have to say. Let's do this shit. Why is there no visible proof of God? I believe this is a valid question that atheists bring up. If God was real and if he loved us, why wouldn't he make his presence known? The fact that he hides shows either God doesn't exist, or he doesn't love us enough to make himself known to prevent us from going to hell. However, the more I study this question from a biblical perspective, you mean the more you Google biblical apologetics and went to Christian websites, right? No, son. The fact that some god doesn't prove itself causes reasonable people to doubt its existence. Their doubt ensures that they're hellbound according to your Christian dogma. If some god really loved us as you claim, it'd make itself known. Knowing I'm saying it, because in direct contradiction to Christianity, I'm not assuming that if a god existed, it would have a gender at all. The hard proof of the existence of this god would erase any doubt, as well as destroy atheism and any other vaguely non-theistic religions like Buddhism, thus increasing the number of believers, thus ensuring their heavenly salvation, which is the entire point of Christianity, right? It is therefore in every human being's best interests, especially Christians, for you God to appear physically to every human being simultaneously and to convert them to Christianity using his omniscient knowledge and his perfect argumentation. A perfectly powerful, all-knowing God would have the ability to do that, right? Okay. You see, the goal of Christianity essentially should then be the end of Christianity. The fulfillment of Christianity's purpose, if you will, would negate the need for Christianity to continue. The whole point is to get people to be Christians, is to get people to accept Jesus into their hearts. And once they all do that, once every person in the world does that, What's the point of continuing on with Christianity? The more I realize that there is no visible proof of God, because he loves us. The fact that God doesn't make himself known empirically shows how much he truly loves us. You should know Jesus already answered this question in the Bible when he gave the parable of the rich man in hell. The rich man asked Abraham to send Lazarus back to warn his brothers of the terrible place he was in. Yet Abraham denied the rich man's request and told him, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. Now at first glance, this doesn't make sense. Why would Abraham deny the rich man's request? No, son. Nothing in your Bible makes sense. And you have to shoehorn in this multiple interpretations and the different translations argument in order to make any interpretation you want to serve your Christian agenda. Essentially proving that all you're doing is serving up apologetics like it's a line for fries at fucking McDonald's. You're not doing anything to convert atheists. You're just mentally masturbating yourself and everyone else who agrees with you. Presuppositional apologetics. Surely if any of us saw a ghost from beyond the grave who had come back to warn us of the dangers of hell, we would certainly be convinced that God exists and we should submit to him. No. If anyone actually sees a ghost or thinks they do, they need to check themselves into a mental institution. You see, under reasonable experimental condition, no ghost has ever been tested, observed, heard, or seen. The existence of TV shows like Ghost Hunters is not evidence. There has never been any evidence of ghosts existing, and the Ghost Hunters people would not be able to swear under oath in court of law that their show is based on fact and that ghosts exist. They would be guilty of perjury, lying under oath, 
which is a felony, and they would all be jailed. All you're doing here is cramming in old superstitions that people had way long before Christianity, and then twisting it to serve a Christian agenda. But what Jesus is saying in this parable is it's not a matter of knowing that God and hell exist. It's a matter of how you feel about God. Son, saying something like, I feel God in my heart, is not evidence. I don't care if you've had a vision of your God. There's a few possibilities I can see here. Either you're insane, and that's anecdotal evidence that needs to be thrown out because of your insanity. Any historian or archaeologist who studies dead cultures could tell you that a personal anecdote or a personal experience or vision having been written down is not scholarly evidence. Eyewitnesses have been proven through multiple modern psychological studies to be unreliable. They forget things, their imagination fills in the blanks, especially under duress and especially over time. I'll link a few studies down below. An anecdotal claim is just a claim without evidence, and it doesn't prove anything to anyone who didn't see what you saw. The other possibility is that you've had some kind of dream or drug-induced hallucination, which multiple scientific studies have proven that drugs can easily recreate psychic phenomenon or visions, which will also be linked down below. Or, of course, you could just be lying to serve your cause. Occam's razor, right? Yeah. Let's just say there was visible proof of God. Let's say he sat on his throne in a palace somewhere in the Middle East. And you could go and see he exists and worship him there. Every human would believe in him and accept that he was God. And no one would go to hell, right? Yeah, that's what I said earlier. I'd also like to add that the existence of a god would necessitate the destruction of all faiths, since if there was a god, there's nothing to prove that he would be like the Bible, Torah, Quran, or anything else that say what a god should be like. There's nothing to prove that the existence of a real god on earth would prove the existence of a heaven or hell. Let's say that there is no heaven or hell, just a god on earth, right? So as you realize that this actually existing God would likely defy all of your scriptures entirely, all of your religions entirely. There are two possibilities. Either you, as the faithful Christian, reject that God because it doesn't fit into your idea of what a Christian God should be, and thus he destroys you for your impudence, or he teaches you the correct way to live your life, you accept it, thus forcing you to no longer be a Christian. So what do you want to choose? Your Christianity or your God? Actually, I think the opposite would happen. Everybody would go to hell. Here's the point. If God was a tangible being on the planet, with all his power and glory, you would worship him and be obedient to his laws because you'd be afraid of him and be afraid of being sent to hell for being disobedient. No. Again, you're using presuppositional apologetics. You're assuming that this God would naturally rule by might and fear. But I'm saying you have no evidence to know that, and the Bible is not evidence. Also, why would a God who is all-powerful, all-knowing, all-loving, and perfectly good be petty enough to rule through Machiavellian means anyway? Thirdly, you're assuming that the existence of a God would necessitate worship. I disagree. If a god reveals itself, I will acknowledge it and become deist. But there's absolutely no reason for me to become theist. His existence negates my need for worship, and I would only ever worship that god in the first place if that god was perfectly morally good. Anything slightly less than moral perfection makes a god unworthy of worship, and thus I wouldn't worship him. You would only be good because you'd be afraid that god might punish you. Your entire motivation for being good would not be because you love God or were thankful for what he did for you on the cross. You would be good because you would be worried about yourself. In other words, you wouldn't be good for goodness sake or for God's sake. You would be good for your own sake. And that's the problem. Uh, isn't that the entire point of Pascal's Wager, a Christian's go-to game theory argument for theism? You realize that you just refuted 
Pascal's wager and just made yourself look really stupid, right? Because that's the mindset that sends people to hell. When you're only thinking of yourself and only worried about taking care of yourself, you become filled with self-absorption. Fear only makes you think of yourself, and thinking of yourself is what sends you to hell. Uh, no. See, your morality is the problem. Doing good things because they help others and make people feel good in the process? That's reason enough for me. I can do good things for the sake of doing good things because they make others feel good and they make me feel good. There's nothing wrong with that. You're the one boiling down all the complexities and gray areas of ethics into one question. Will it get me into heaven or will it take me to hell? Who's got the fucked up moral system now? If fear only makes you think of yourself, then operating on a moral system of reward in heaven and punishment in hell, which you're doing as a Christian, means that you're essentially undoing your own argument by not getting the logic behind it. What you're essentially saying here, which is your whole point, is that anything not compatible with Christianity is self-absorption, which means it'll get people in hell. So all you are is just another Christian threatening people with hell because they don't think in the way that you do. Bravo, son. Bravo. See, when Jesus came into this world, he taught that salvation meant the opposite. He taught that his salvation was only for people who didn't put themselves first. In Matthew 10, 39, he said, He who finds his life will lose it, and he who loses his life for my sake will find it. So Jesus is congratulating people for dying in his name? In this quote in Matthew? Well, that sure explains the whole of Christian history then, but it really feels out of place for the whole, you know, turn the other cheek, the meek shall inherit the earth, prince of peace, we were all forced to believe that Jesus was, right? And I can quote Matthew out of context for you too, you know? Think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. For I am come to send a man at variance against his father, and daughter at variance against her mother, and daughter-in-law at variance against her mother-in-law, and a man's foes shall be they of his own household. For he that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Matthew chapter 10 verses 34 through 37. Do you miss the absolute irony of you using an illustration of the great god Zeus to serve as a stand-in for your Christian god? Because I don't. That shit is hilarious. You fail. Then in Matthew 25, he gave the parable of the talents, which is a story of servants. Two go out and serve their king with the money the king gives them. And the third becomes filled with fear and buries the money the king gives him because he's afraid of what the king might do to him. And because the servant is only thinking of himself, he hides the money for his own safety. Thus, the king disposes of him, because the servant was self-absorbed. Maybe not in the usual way we think of self-absorption, but nonetheless, he was still self-absorbed. See, in the parable of the rich man in hell, what Abraham is saying back to the rich man is, fear will never work. Sending Lazarus back to warn his brothers of the dangers of hell will only create fear. And fear doesn't get you to stop focusing on yourself only makes you think of yourself even more. And if God was a visible being on the planet, you would be utterly filled with fear. You wouldn't change from thinking of yourself to thinking of a relationship with God or start loving God and loving your fellow man. You would only be thinking of yourself and how to avoid hell. So your actions would change, but your heart wouldn't. It would still be self-absorbed, just in a different way, but still self-absorbed. No, 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 no. See, Christianity is all about getting into heaven, son. You're thinking about yourself. You're serving your own self-interests by avoiding hell and entering heaven. That's the point of Christianity. You're completely oblivious to the fact that you're refuting yourself. What changes your heart is learning what God did for you on the cross, knowing the most radical act of love that ever happened, which is when God went willingly to the cross to take our place, even though we didn't deserve it. And where you find that is in reading about Moses and the prophets. When you learn about that and accept it as truth, then your heart begins to change. And you see that even though you deserve hell, God took it upon himself. 
When you know the love of God, that is when your heart begins to change. Many people have a misconception about the path to heaven. They think it's just living a good life and following all the rules. So if God was real, he should make his presence known, so I'll know that heaven and hell exist and I can follow all of God's commandments. But when people do that, the heart doesn't change. You're still self-absorbed, because your attitude becomes, I'm doing good, I'm working hard, so God has to bless me. And you're only thinking of yourself. You are using your moral deeds to force God to bless you. The only way to change the heart is through a radical transformation of love. And we see that love when we read about Jesus and what he did on the cross. Yeah, because reading about some guy getting ritually murdered totally inspires love, right? So you're telling me that you look at pictures of a man being covered in blood, his own blood, and being tortured to death and murdered and having a spear stabbed through his side. That makes you think of love? Are you kidding me? You look at pictures of torture and murder and that makes you happy? The fuck is wrong with you? You see, here's the deal. If you get into heaven and you know that there are billions of other people who are not getting in, you are serving yourself by staying in heaven. If you don't jump into the fire to save those sinners, you are serving yourself. I love how all you guys ever talk about is how terrible you are and how great God is and how terrible your, your body is and your sexual thoughts and your sexual needs. But God is so awesome, right? You're a piece of shit, but God is great. If, if, if it were a woman saying that about her boyfriend, you'd call it domestic abuse. Say the th same thing, you know, regarding yourself and your God, and, and, and suddenly it's, it's grace. Suddenly this is piousness. Suddenly it's okay that your God tells you that you're a piece of shit. And only through the human sacrifice of himself to himself, you are spared from the hell that every single one of you deserves? I don't think anyone deserves eternal torture for the rest of their lives, ever. I don't think anyone deserves that. Okay? Yet, I'm the damned one, right? I'm the hell-bound one. I'm the insane one because I won't drink your fucking Kool-Aid. Okay? If I was going into heaven, I would leap out. You know why? Because if I go to eternal paradise, and while a single person gets eternal torture, that's immoral. And I'd rather take the torture than let anyone else receive it in my stead. If God was a powerful king on the planet, you wouldn't see the love he gave for you there. All you would see is this mighty king, and you would never know the love he has for you or what he really wanted for you. You would just be filled with fear, and self-absorption. Many people have a misconception that God kicked Adam and Eve out of the garden because he didn't want to be with them anymore, which is not true. Jesus had Adam and Eve leave the garden because he saw they had become self-absorbed and they were only thinking of themselves. And in such a state, if they were to stay with God, they would only try to please him and form a relationship with him to see what they could get out of it. Their entire attitude would be, I want to please you, God, not because I love you, but because I love myself and want to be blessed. So because of their new sinful attitude, God had no choice but to make them leave his presence. Not because he didn't want to be with them, but because he knew what the relationship would be with them. And he could not look upon such a relationship. Instead, we needed to see the action of how much he truly loved us before we could begin to escape our self-absorption. Now, in the relationship we have with him, he gives us everything and in return he asks that we give him everything back. Not because he's selfish, but because he was utterly selfless. He came into our world in weakness, and willingly died for you because he loves you more than you can imagine and he doesn't want to be in a relationship where you fear him for your own life's sake. He loves you and he wants you to love him back. So knowing the true nature of your heart and the mindset you would have if he was here visibly, he instead reveals himself in ways that won't assure your damnation. Who's to say that some God on earth wouldn't tell anyone that he loves them? Why would people be incapable of knowing the love of their God if he's on the earth to physically tell them about it? If anything, at this point, you are just serving your own dogma for its own sake. Because you know, without all these bullshit rules, and the ad hoc speculation, and the special pleading, you're nothing, and Christianity is nothing. So you'd rather hold up 
a bullshit myth than think critically about all the holes in it. Your faith boat has long since taken on water, son, and by paling out the water and praying instead of abandoning ship, you're just letting yourself be dragged down into the depths of fear and self-loathing. I have no self-loathing. I'm a pansexual. I enjoy my sexuality. I enjoy having consensual, protected sex with whoever I want. Men, women, transgender people, it doesn't matter. I'm attracted to them all, and I enjoy that. It's fun for me. It feels good. There is nothing wrong with it. There's no sin in that, because sin doesn't exist. But without sin, you got no reason to feel guilty. Without the guilt, you got no reason for salvation. And without being brainwashed into believing that you need salvation, you might start thinking for yourself. And as James Joyce said, there is no philosophy or heresy more abhorrent to the church than a human being. Johnny Ringo out.